Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Yvonne Sh- and I am an alcoholic. Hi, so nice to be here. I'd like to thank Chris for inviting me to come up here and share with you all tonight, and Chris and Barbara and the whole group um, for being so hospitable. <laughs> um, what a, <laughs> this is a great group. I love the energy. I don't know, sometimes, you know, you walk in a meeting you're not familiar with, and it's just like, uh, <laughs> you know? I love, I love, I love walking into energy, and I'll tell you, I'd like to welcome you if you're new. Um, I think probably the most important thing that I have to say for myself tonight is that I love Alcoholics Anonymous. I absolutely love Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're new and you think that's crazy, I, I relate to you. I do. Um, I, um, I'm one of those people that um, I didn't have to come to Alcoholics Anonymous. Nobody put a gun to my head, but um, I had lost custody of my daughter, and getting custody of her back was contingent on my going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I wanted custody of her. So I went to AA, and I sat in the back of the room hating it. And I was raised um, Catholic. I have a wonderful Catholic family. There's nothing wrong with Catholicism. Um, please don't hear that in what I have to say. But I didn't like it when I was growing up. And I hated Mass in particular. And I felt like every week when I went to Mass, it was like an hour of this boring, horrid thing I had to get through. And when I was new to Alcoholics Anonymous, I felt like meetings were the same thing. I had to sit in the back. I just, I hated it. And my experience is, is that, um, <laughs> that I, I got a sponsor. Actually, she appointed herself to me. I wouldn't have asked her. Um, she told me she was going to be my sponsor, and then she gave me a whole bunch of direction that I'll get into later. But she kind of intimidated me, so I did what she asked. And I'll tell you, my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is that my mind follows where my feet go. I had a sponsor that trained my feet in Alcoholics Anonymous, and somewhere along the line, I went from hating Alcoholics Anonymous to just falling in love with it. And um, there's nothing better. There's nothing better that's happened to me in my life, and you'll get that <laughs> real clear. Um, I was born in Los Angeles. That's I think you said that right. I'm from LA. <laughs> um, I was born in Los Angeles. I I actually it doesn't really matter, but I was born in a maternity home for teenagers. Um, in downtown L.A., and I was given up for adoption to a wonderful Catholic family. The only reason maybe it matters is I'm the only alcoholic in my family. Um, I, you know, if you're into the whole genetic thing, I don't really care. I'm alcoholic. But, um, <laughs> but the point is, is that my family has never understood the way I drank. And, <laughs> frankly, I don't understand the way they drink either. <laughs> um, I have an older sister that um, I idolized her growing up. And I have to tell you right off the bat that our book describes my sister. Our book says that there's a certain type of hard drinker that if given a good enough reason is able to stop or moderate. That's my sister. And that was a big problem for me because my sister was like this. She hit 12 and like turned into this wild party animal. (laughs) She would run away from home for a week. I mean, I never did that when I was 12, 13 years old. I mean, she looked crazy. My sister did, but my sister went in one of those teenage scared straight programs. She stayed sober, not with the help of AA, just on her own, for six years. And ever since then, she's been able to drink like a gentleman. <laughs> so, you know, when it came time for me to get sober, my, my family wanted me to do what my sister did, and I couldn't. You know, I don't understand that kind of drinking. But I have to say, my sister introduced me to alcohol when I was about four years old. Um, that's when she was 12. <laughs> she was 12. She was hitting her party stage about the same time that my parents started relying on her to babysit me. <laughs> um, my sister, she's like, not me. She's five foot ten and a half with blonde hair and green eyes. And I loved my sister growing up. She, oh, I wanted to be just like her, like I said. And she would, she would either go party in Hollywood or she would go down to Venice Beach and she would take me with her. And I have this memory of, um, <laughs> she hates it when I talk about this. She's, she's, I think she could benefit from the program of Alan on and tell you the truth. But um, she's, she's so embarrassed for doing this. I tell her she did me a favor, really. Um, my sister used to take me to these parties with her, and she would tell, she always dated these, like, really big, muscular men. And she would say, she would take me to the party, and she would say, you know, my little, my little sister can drink you all under the table. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I remember her saying that, and I remember feeling pride. I mean, I don't know how much I drank when I, when I was that age, but man, I was proud. And I do remember that they would line up the beers, and I would start drinking, and pretty soon, like, I remember being little and just, like, spinning. Oh, the, oh, our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, talks about, in the doctor's opinion, that men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. I don't understand why anyone drinks other than for the effect produced by alcohol. <laughs> I understand that I'm in the right place. If you're contemplating that, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> um, but that, that's what it was. I don't remember my first drink. I don't remember my first drunk. But I remember the magic of alcohol and what alcohol did for me. And what it did for me at four is it made me part of the teenage crowd. It made me part of the high schoolers. And I wasn't the little brat that had to come along. I was part of the party, and I knew they all wanted me there, and I was loved and wanted, and I felt secure, and it was wonderful. Now, <laughs> I didn't <clears throat> start sucking on a bottle and head down to Skid Row or anything. Uh, I, you know, frankly, I only drank when my sister um, provided alcohol for me, but my sister ended up going in that Teenage Scared Straight program when I was nine years old. And um, at the same time, my parents did a geographic. They moved from Los Angeles to Fairfax, Virginia, which is a suburb a little outside of D.C. And uh, yeah, they were trying to, you know, they wanted to raise their family in a good place. You know, my, my sister's problems were because of L.A. It was always something. If they could just, you know, calm down and I, I, calm her down, really. <laughs> so we moved to Virginia, and I didn't drink again until I was 11. And 11 is when I started drinking. <laughs> <laughs> That wasn't meant to be funny. But <laughs> In fact, I don't think it's funny at all since I have an 11-year-old. <laughs> um, I... When I was 11 years old, I remember one of the first times I drank on my own. <laughs> I was at my girlfriend Heather Smith's house, and her parents had gone out of the country. They would travel to places. They happened to be in Malaysia this time. Uh, I just remember it sounded exotic to me at that age. Um, they were in Malaysia, and she had some high school girl. Her sisters were in high school. And Heather had some girlfriends over for the weekend. We were all in sixth grade. And, you know, it's bizarre for me to think about now, but at the time, I think the sixth graders were doing sixth grade stuff. I don't know what that is, but what I know is that I hadn't had a drink in a couple years, and um, the high school girls were getting wasted. And so I walked up to those girls. I put my hands on my hips, and I said, you know, I could drink you all under the table. <laughs> and they laughed at me, but they gave me a liter of seven and seven. And uh, I understand that I finished that bottle, that liter. I don't know. Um, I don't know what happened that night. I <laughs> I remember starting that bottle somewhere in there. I have no. I, I could not even begin to tell you what happened. The only thing I can tell you with certainty is that when I woke up in the next morning, <laughs> I was lying in my training bra on the basement floor. I found, <laughs> I found my clothes on the third floor, and I had urinated in them sometime during the night. I mean, <laughs> that's the way I drank when I was 11 years old. <laughs> I tell you, I never drank any prettier than that. that, that <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, not, um, I'm not somebody that wants to know what kind of wine will go with my salmon. <laughs> I... Um, <laughs> I want to feel something. I love, you know, I love alcohol. If I could have, you know, my favorite year, I'll get to this, was when I was 19 years old, I have to say, and I got sober at 21, so for whatever that's worth. But if I could have drank the way I drank at 19, I wouldn't be here in Alcoholics Anonymous. That was my favorite year. Where I got sober back, um, I got sober in the D.C. metropolitan area, and back there I would hear people say a lot that um, they would say this thing, they would say, my, um, my worst day sober is better than my best day drinking. And I remember when I was new, like grabbing onto that, like uh, I think it talks about it in a vision for you, like a, like a boy whistling in the dark. Yeah, that's true. That's true. My, my worst day sober is better than my best day drinking. But that's not true at all. <laughs> I love drinking alcohol. If I hadn't hung in there, I wouldn't have made it to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I'd have no reason to. I love the effect produced by alcohol. And, um... I, um, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a little confused about what my problem was, and I'll get into that more later, but, um, I, I didn't believe I was alcoholic. In fact, I didn't think that anyone who was 21 years old could be alcoholic, really. And the one thing that started to get me when I started to sit in meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous is I would hear speakers, even if I didn't relate to their story, I would hear them talk about a concept referred to as anxious apartness. 
And when I heard that expression, I related to it immediately. From the time that I was, I don't know, probably 9, 10, 11, I don't know when exactly it happened for me, but all of a sudden I felt anxious apartness all the time. I felt like whatever group of kids I was hanging out with the time, with at the time, I didn't feel like I fit in with them. I felt different. And I think when I look back now and, and try to remember the way it was really, I don't think it probably looked like I was any different. It was just my perception. But I lived with this sense of impending doom all of the time that whatever group of friends that I was gonna, that I was spending time with at the time that they were going to catch on that I didn't really fit in with them and so I I had to leave those people before they woke up one day and said Yvonne you know you don't you know you're not really one of us and changing groups of friends was my best solution and the other thing I did was that I drank alcohol because when I drank alcohol I didn't care <laughs> I didn't care about anything I felt confident and popular and beautiful and smart and and everything I wanted to feel it was I felt better than anybody when I was drinking alcohol I knew um I knew that there was something different about me or I suspected there was something different about me I'm sure it's actually not as true as as much in reality as it was in my perception but when I was in high school I got involved with the theater (laughs) the theater department imagine that um (laughs) I uh when I um, started acting in high school, ooh, <laughs> I, but I had this moment of clarity that I understood what my problem was. You know, my parents had uprooted us and moved us to Los Angeles, I mean, to Fairfax, Virginia, when I was nine years old. I'm an actress. That means I'm an artist. I have an artistic mentality. Of course I wouldn't fit in with people who live in Fairfax County, Virginia. I mean... <laughs> I knew, I had this idea that if I could just move up to New York City, that I would meet my people and I would fit in instantly. I, <laughs> I knew that. So I got really involved in the drama department, like I said. And when I was 17 years old, I got a scholarship to New York University. I studied at the Tisch School of the Arts there, and I, um, I entered the Lee Strasberg Theater Institute. Now, to you, that was like a dream come true. I, I moved up to New York City. It was like a month before my 18th birthday, and I mean, acting was supposed to be what I wanted to do with my life, <laughs> but I got to New York City, and I mean, there were more important things to do than go to college in New York City. <laughs> I'll tell you, I it was so much fun. To begin with, um, in New York City, the bars close at 4 o'clock in the morning. It's 2 in D.C. It's 4 in New York City, and then there's after-hours clubs after that, and they're open till 6. And then once you get in the crowd, right, there's the illegal after-after-hours clubs. So you can be out all night. And also, you don't need an ID to buy liquor in New York City. Now, in D.C., I knew where I could drive in southeast D.C. to go buy booze, or I'd get the college guys across the street to buy it for me. But it was always inconvenient. I had to, I had to plan a little bit. In New York City, I could go anywhere and buy liquor. So I, um, I was out drinking every night, and um, I ended up having to leave NYU after a semester, um, I got my transcripts when I was sober sometime, and I got, I found out that my GPA for that one semester was 2.44. Now, I know that doesn't sound too hideous, but I only had one academic course. <laughs> Tish is a conservatory. Everything was like acting, singing, voice, Tai Chi Chuan. <laughs> 2.44, you know, and um, I dropped out of school, and my mother was um, financially supporting me, and she explained to me that she was not going to support me if I wasn't in college. I tried to explain to her that I didn't need college because I was an artist. <laughs> and unfortunately, she had been to this program called Tough Love, <laughs> and um, so she stopped sending me money, and, um, you know, I went from job after job, and I kept getting fired from jobs because I just I couldn't show up. I was too drunk, you know, too hungover. I'd get home so late I couldn't get up to go to work. And I remember I was, like, looking for a job for a couple weeks and rent's coming due, and I have that sense of fear, and I start looking through the newspaper, and I see this ad that says um, they're looking for cocktail waitresses and dancers. And I think that's a little weird, but, I mean, a dancer? <laughs> but I thought I might as well go check it out. And um, so I, I went to this address, which was roughly in the neighborhood of 42nd and 8th. <laughs> And I had never been in that neighborhood in my life. Um, I, uh, I thought of myself as kind of a worldly 18-year-old. Um, <laughs> but um, the truth is, I was, I was quite naive. I was raised in this. I mean, I was a you know, promiscuous girl growing up because I looked for my solution in absolutely anything outside of myself. But, but I thought of myself as worldly, but I was, really, I was raised in this Roman Catholic family. We went to church. I went to Catholic schools for a great deal of my um, upbringing. And 
I walk into this club at 42nd and 8th. It, it was called the Star Club, and um, <laughs> it was the neon sign outside that really got me. But I walked in, and, of course, I had never been. It was a strip club, and I have never been in one of those in my entire life. But it was exactly how I pictured it in my mind's eye. <laughs> this place was like, it was a shotgun bar. And it was dark and dirty, and um, all the dancers at the Star Club were past their prime. <laughs> it was about the... <laughs> I've never seen such a sight in my life. <laughs> And I was about to walk out, but the manager, Tony, walked up to me, and um, <laughs> he asked me if I wanted a job, and um, <laughs> I was like, cocktail waitress, I'm a cocktail waitress, <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, so he hired me on the spot, and the next day, I, I, um, I went to work the next day for my very first day at the Star Club, and I made this promise to myself that I was only going to work there for two weeks, and that was, I was supposed to, it was like setting a bar for myself that would supposedly get me out of bed in the morning to go looking for a job during the day, and then I'd go to work at night, and I show up the first night at the Star Club, and um, I find out there that what cocktail waitresses do, they don't bring drinks to the guys. <laughs> they, um, a guy comes and sits down at the bar, and then I'm supposed to go sit next to him and engage him in pleasant conversation, and then <laughs> the bartender will come over and say, would you like to buy the lady a drink? That drink is $20, and it buys him eight minutes of conversation. And I think, well, that's about the weirdest thing I've ever heard, but <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't have any money, so I, you know, I've got to work. So I go, and that first night, I mean, this is hokey and just gross, and but that first night, there was this young, rich, handsome Greek man that came in, and he sat down next to me, and he bought me drinks all night. Now, I get a commission off those drinks. He bought me drinks all night. He was really intelligent. His conversation was wonderful. He never once tried to put a hand on my shoulder, nothing, just wonderful. And I walked out of there that night with $300, and I thought, you know, I don't know why I only wanted to work here for two weeks. I <laughs> $300? I'm going to be making like $80,000 a year. <laughs> and so the next night I go in the Star Club and um, there was no young, rich, handsome Greek guy. <laughs> and I walked out of there that night with $60 and I'm like, oh, what a ripoff. <laughs> now it would have been fine if I had made $60 from night one, but now I've already calculated how wealthy I'm going to be and it's not cutting it. So Tony says, you know, if you um, went up on stage... And I'm like, no, no, I can't do that. And he gave me a fifth of vodka. And um, <laughs> after all, I did always want to be on the stage. <laughs> I thought I'd be wearing a little more of it. <laughs> so um, that year, um, I, I, was, uh, I found out shortly that there's a whole class system of clubs like that in New York City. And uh, I ended up going to work. There was a place that opened. I started working there the third night. It was called Scores. And... Um, and, uh, yeah, whoo, someone's been there. <laughs> now, mind you, I was, um, I was five foot four, 112 pounds, long red hair, 18 years old. And, um, I mean, I felt so powerful. That's the year that if I could have just stayed, I mean, I made a ton of money that year. You know, my, um, <laughs> I, I, oh, what a great year. I just, I, <laughs> <laughs> I just remember that year walking down the street and just always feeling like I had power, like I was just powerful. And um, what happened for me is I, I, um, I still toyed with the idea that I was an artist of sorts, and um, it didn't mean I actually ever did anything artistic. It just meant that <laughs> um, I wanted to experience that everything that life had, had to offer. I mean, I wanted to try everything for the sake of my art. <laughs> And when I say that, I mean, like, I hitchhiked to Burlington, Vermont to go to a rainbow gathering, for example. Um, I experimented with a lot of different things, um, including drugs. Now, uh, sometimes, I think this is true for a lot of people. I hear a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous. A lot of times when I was in high school, it was sometimes easier to buy something like pot than it was to get booze. And um, But... But usually for me, um, I would always go back to drinking because, like, I would smoke pot and then I would feel tired all the time and then I wouldn't want to party. And, and alcohol just, it gave me something that nothing else did, you know, or I'd try acid. But it just wasn't the same thing as drinking. And, but I did want to try every, I, you know, I would 
try cocaine just to see what it's like. And um, there was another dancer there, um, and she would shoot heroin from time to time. <laughs> and um, I asked her one time if I wanted to try it with her, but just snort it because I thought needles was kind of extreme. <laughs> 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 and uh, <laughs> but I wanted to see what it felt like. <laughs> I mean, my only experience with heroin was um, I read, I think it's a Judy Bloom book. When I was in uh, middle school, it was called Dinky Hooker Shoot Snack, and it just, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it, it, why not, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, I asked Katie one time if she would take me to do heroin with her, and, um, but I said, but you got to promise me that we're only going to snort it because, you know, that needle thing is really weird. <laughs> and um, she said, yeah, that was, you know, I had arm twist a little. I don't like to give anyone their first experience, but um, <laughs> but I got her to go, and she took me down to the Lower East Side into Alphabet City. Actually, it was second between A and B, although I wasn't supposed to know that. In fact, she made me wait around the corner when she went to score because she said I looked like 21 Jump Street. <laughs> and I poked my head around the corner, and I watched her, and she walked up to this um, doorway. They have this really elaborate system in New York City that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. <laughs> um, she went to this doorway, and she walked up to this guy, and she went, Hey, Frankie. And he goes, Hey, Katie. And uh, then, you know, they exchanged money. He whistled. There's a bunch of whistles. And then, you know, she walks out. And um, I remember watching that because at the same – I was only going to try this one time, but at the same time, I couldn't stand the thought of – I don't ever like to rely on anyone else. <laughs> I mean, if I was ever going to do it again, I want to know how to do it myself. Um, <laughs> but I wasn't going to, of course. Um, <laughs> and after we got it, we ran into a friend of Katie's who happened to be an RN, and her apartment was closer than Katie's. So we went back there, and because she's an RN, she had needles, and then they start cooking it up, and then I... <laughs> I said, Katie, but you said we were only going to... And she said, you know, if you're going to do it, you ought to do it right. And I thought, well, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, if I'm just going to try it one time. And um, <clears throat> Now, um, I'll tell you, I, I shot heroin for the first time that night. And as with um, <laughs> what happens to um, anybody who shoots heroin on a continuous basis, I, I ended up getting physically addicted. But... I have to say that heroin and alcohol did two entirely different things for me. This is one of the first things I like to talk about. I never, ever, ever, ever shot heroin in order to go out and do something. I never shot heroin to go to a party. <laughs> I shot heroin to just shut my brain off and make everything go away. Alcohol did something entirely different for me. I drank alcohol in order to get up and go to on auditions, to go to a party, to go um, out on a date, to, to in order to do anything that um, required any kind of courage, or so I thought on my part, I drank alcohol. Um, what happened, though, is I, I did end up, I obviously quit shooting hair. I continued to shoot heroin, actually, and got physically addicted. And when I did, I would go through periods of time where I quit drinking altogether. And so when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, um, I remember somebody came up to me and they, I got here because an institution brought me, and this institution incorrectly told me that it didn't matter what 12-step program I went to. And the reason that I know that that's incorrect today is because I have to hear the music of my disease in order to believe in the solution, in order to take the actions required. I am not going to get, personally, I'm not going to get recovery from the disease of alcoholism in a meeting for people who have a problem with food, for example. Um, my, my facility didn't happen to know that, and they sent me to Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, thankfully that's how God works in my life. But the, the first woman walked up to me and asked me if I was an alcoholic, and I said, no, I don't even drink, <laughs> and, um, which was true. But thankfully, um, this woman, for some reason, I don't know why, but she asked me to write out an inventory. And when I wrote out that inventory, I saw the way that I drank when I was four and the way I drank when I was nine and the way I drank when I was 11. And, um, and, uh, and sitting in open meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, not participating, but sitting here listening, I began to identify with people who had the disease of alcoholism. So, um, I, I, um, I have to tell you that I shot heroin, though, because there's a part of my story I can't tell you that just doesn't make sense without it. And that's this. When I got um, physically addicted to heroin, I got scared. I moved back down to D.C., and I thought, I'm just going to – I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to drink. Drinking was still fun for me at that time. And I got a job bartending in D.C., and my whole life was going to be different in two weeks. And um, there I'm out partying at the clubs, and it's all fun and games again. And um, I remember one night getting loaded and thinking, you know, I don't know why I thought I had to quit heroin altogether. <laughs> I am um, – 
I just shouldn't do it enough to get physically addicted. And um, I started uh, I started doing heroin again when I found out that I was pregnant. And I was I was two months pregnant, and I was shooting heroin about twice a week, and only twice a week because I was getting robbed all the time, actually. But um, I the moment I found out I was pregnant, I thought this is my solution. I, I might not have said it just like that, but I instantly felt like everything was going to be okay. New York City had not been the answer for me, but I knew that this baby was. I knew I was going to have a little girl, and I knew that she was going to love me with all her heart, and I would love her with all my heart, and that was going to make everything. I was going to be able to live with her. And um, I, I went to the doctor, and um, actually the day I found out I was pregnant, I quit smoking cigarettes, I quit drinking, and I quit using drugs. And I went to the doctor four days later, and I told the doctor what I was doing and asked if the baby was going to be okay. And my doctor told me that the greatest danger to a baby in utero was spontaneous abortion and that my daughter was still alive, so she would probably be fine. And then my doctor asked me if I needed help, and I said, no, I already quit four days ago. <laughs> it made sense to me. And um, I... Um, uh, my bootstrapping got very short, you know, during that period of time. I um, I used to be able to muster up enough whatever it takes to stay sober on my own will for a period of time. And for a little while while I was pregnant, all I could picture was that I was going to have this baby. And I wanted to have a healthy baby, and I didn't want to hurt her, and I wanted everything to be just right. But when everything in my life goes south, I got demoted. Um, I, <laughs> I bartended at a club in D.C., and, you know, when I started the show, they didn't want a pregnant woman behind the bar. So they demoted me to hostess. I told them that they were unfair, <laughs> but they didn't care, you know. And um, my um, my the guy left, and then the new guy was um, <laughs> the new guy totaled my new car. And I mean, I remember this day just thinking the whole world is out to get me. <laughs> you know, it never crossed my mind. It's decisions that I make or situations I put myself in. It's that God or the world or whatever it is is out to get me. And I remember I uh, I lived in this. Um, really bad part of northeast dc at the time and i you know stopped working at the bar for the night and i got out of the cab and i saw the people on the corner and i thought you know i'm just going to go say hello and then that voice said that's not what you're doing you know what you're doing and then the voice that followed was i don't care and that night um, i started drinking i started shooting heroin i started smoking crack i would do anything that you put in front of me because i couldn't stand the thought of coming to with the realization of what i was doing and um, I don't know how long I did that for. I know that for some reason I went to a prenatal visit. I, that baffles me today, but I went. And um, the doctor instantly saw my swollen hands, and, um, and she said that I had three choices, that I could try to quit shooting heroin on my own because I was now physically addicted again. I could quit shooting heroin on my own, and, um, and the baby might die. Or I could continue to do it, and when she was born, she would be drug tested, and they would remove her from my custody or I could go on methadone. And so I went on methadone, and my daughter was born. I don't know how much. I My period of time is, I don't remember anything, but I know that when my daughter was born, I watched her detox in the neonatal intensive care unit for 16 days, and I sat there with her every single day and every single night. And I remember people coming to me and asking me if I needed some help, and I said, no, um, I um, I did one of those 21-day methadone detoxes after she was born, and I said, you know, if I ever think about drinking again, and now I wasn't going to do anything. Nothing's fun anymore. I'm never going to drink again. And I said, if I ever think about drinking again, I will picture her shaking in that little plastic tub, and I won't do it. And my daughter was uh, released to me at 16 days old. She was wearing an apnea bradycardia monitor, and I was dragging her and that monitor in and out of crack houses three days later. And I spent the first nine months of her life, and I would I would go live in a crack house for a month and then go home to my mom and try to clean up, and my mom would try to help me, and she wouldn't report it to anybody because she would think that this time it, I was going to do something about it. And um, I started working for an escort service, and one day um, <laughs> the madam, Kaylee, called me in, um, and she said that I couldn't work for her anymore because I had track marks again, and <laughs> they had standards at those places. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am... Um, I went back to this. I was staying at this dilapidated row house in northeast D.C., and I was paying this woman to want $20 a day. She was a junkie, and I was paying her to watch my baby, and I went back to her, and um, I needed $200 a day to get straight. And um, she said, you know, that's not a problem. My brother, my brother Buttons is a pimp. We'll just page him, and you can go work for Buttons. And um, I didn't have a better answer. <laughs> 
So she paged buttons, and he took me down to the street corner in D.C., and he told me what it was I was going to do. And um, when I got sober, I heard a, a tape of a man named Norm Alpe, and he would talk about seconds and inches. And I always think of this part of my story because I think that was my second and inches. And I didn't get sober this night, but it completely changed my life. And that was that I um, I got into the first car, and I engaged in an argument with my customer. <laughs> See, um, he felt like he had just picked me off up off the street, so I was street price, whereas I felt like I had just come from an escort service, I was a little more valuable. <laughs> and uh, we, we dickered for a few minutes, and I guess the police car behind us got tired of waiting. <laughs> and they went ahead and put their lights on and asked me to step out of the vehicle, but nothing had happened yet, and I told them, it's not what you think. You know, only guilty people say that. It's not what you think. <laughs> How do I know what you think? <laughs> And they agreed to let me go home that night, but they said if they saw me out on the street again, they would arrest me on sight. So I went back to Tawana's place, and Button said he would send someone to take care of me, and he didn't do that. And at 7.15 in the morning, I was in a whole world of pain, and um, I knew my mother was about to leave for work, but I was too ashamed to speak to her. But I called her, and when she answered the phone, all I said was, if you bring me $20, I'll let you have the baby. And she was more than happy to do that. She came and got her granddaughter, and... um, and my granddaughter went to live in a home with somebody, uh, my daughter, her granddaughter, went to live in a home with a family that could take care of her. And um, I spent uh, the next four months, I got a job at a club on the on the block in Baltimore where they had back rooms for the customers to take the girls. And I'll tell you, when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous and I finally sat around and listened, and I heard chapter three read, and I heard the expression pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization, the hair on my arm stood up because I knew what that felt like. Um... I woke up one day in Baltimore, and I thought I'll, I thought I would do anything to just see my little girl again. They wouldn't even let me visit her. Uh, I missed her first Christmas and her first birthday, and my mother told me she was walking, and the last time I saw her, she was just lying on her stomach, raising her little arms up, and, um, and I, I didn't want to get sober. I didn't want to get sober. I got sent to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous when I was 13 years old. My mother sent me to AA when I was 13 because of the way I drank at 13. And I remember going to Alcoholics Anonymous. It was in Truro Episcopal Church in Fairfax, Virginia. All I remember about the meeting is that it was a big room. The chairs were in a circle. It was a smoking meeting. You could smoke back then. And... um I don't remember anything about the meeting at all. I don't remember anyone talking to me. I don't remember anything about our book, Alcoholics Anonymous, or the steps. I'm not saying nobody talked to me. I had contempt prior to investigation. (laughs) From the time I was 11, I'm sure. I I don't remember anything. The only thing I can tell you about that meeting is that I saw a 17-year-old guy there, and I thought he was really cute. But I thought that if he had gone to AA, he must be a pretty bad dude. So after the meeting, I asked him if he had ever killed anyone. (laughs) And he told me he had, and I thought, oh, he's so cool. I never related to the disease of alcoholism. I so... There I was, you know, in Baltimore, my daughter is, I have no idea where. It never crossed my mind. I had to go to Alcoholics Anonymous and sober up. Um, You know... (laughs) When I got sober, I heard Clancy talk about it, and, and this is so true. I got sent to, you know, my whole time, from the time I my life, from the time I was 13 to the time I was 21 when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous, every once in a while some do-gooder would send me to AA. But it seemed to me, um, I wouldn't have said it then, but now in looking back, I never thought Alcoholics Anonymous was a place for me because it seemed to me I come in a room like this, and if you're new tonight, um, maybe you'll... You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. You come in a room like this, and everyone here is put together and happy and smiley. How are you guys so happy when you're not drinking? (laughs) I don't know. I only feel good when I drink alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous cannot be a place that I belong because you guys feel better when you quit drinking. I drink because of the way I feel when I quit drinking. I um, I woke up on this particular day, though, and I thought, I'll do absolutely anything to see my little girl again. And I, I thought to myself, what can I do? And the only thing I could come up with on my own was that I would um, go on methadone, and then that would I would just quit doing everything except methadone. <laughs> and um, I started calling clinics, and they were all closed, or um, they weren't accepting new people, or they thought I was too young, or you know, one thing after another. And I went to the um, club that night, and my mother tracked me down, and um, she called me and said, there's a facility that takes moms and babies, and if you're willing to go... Um, 
you can have custody of your daughter back. And I went into a detox a couple days later, um, and I, I don't count that week of detox as part of my sobriety. For one thing, they gave me a lot of drugs. For another thing, I brought my own with me. I am... <laughs> My experience after going to many detoxes is that they don't usually give you enough to take the edge off, so <laughs> I know to supplement. <laughs> um, I ran out somewhere early on, and I know that the day I walked out, um, February 10th, 1994, that's my sobriety date. I know I was as physically sober on that day as I am today. That's also the day I got custody of my little girl back. She was a little over a year old. Um, I went into a treatment facility. I had to go to this long-term thing for mothers and babies. I lived in residential with my daughter for 14 months. And that's where I was first, um, well, I was sent to, to AA and um, other things, you know, anything really. Um, I'm, I'm so grateful for that facility because it, it, it kept me um, secluded for like a year, which was great for someone like me. But I got out of there, and um, I thank God for Alcoholics Anonymous because what actually happened is one time when I was in one of my detoxes, they took us to NIH to hear the step workshop that Sandy Beach put on. And I don't remember anything about what he talked about, but I remember he made me laugh. And it was the first time I thought, oh, well, that's weird. I laughed in Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, that's really weird. <laughs> I, I um, When I was like 11 months sober in this treatment facility and I started getting passes, I showed up at the Unity Club in Virginia. It's like a, like a Alano club. Um, and there, there was a flyer, and there was going to be a spaghetti dinner, and Sandy Beach was going to be speaking at it. And I thought, you know what, that's that guy that made me laugh that time. And I went to that speaker meeting, and it was there that I met my sponsor. This woman, like, chased me down for 30 days. <laughs> and um, she kept calling me, what are you doing? Who's your sponsor? And the thing is, I wouldn't ask anyone to sponsor me because I didn't feel like anyone was really qualified. <laughs> I, um, I had a list of um, requirements that my sponsor had to fulfill. <laughs> Like things like my sponsor had to be, my sponsor had to have shot heroin and been addicted to it, had to have been on methadone, had to have had a daughter, had to have lost custody of the daughter, had to get the daughter back, <laughs> <laughs> had to have been a stripper, had to have been a prostitute. <laughs> um, there were a few more things, but I couldn't seem to find anybody. That <laughs> I didn't really feel like how anybody could have a solution for me unless they experienced the same things that I had experienced out there. This, this girl followed me around for 30 days, and then, you know, she kept asking me, who's your sponsor? And then one day she said, you know what, I'm going to sponsor you for 30 days. And it's so weird when I, I know her still today, and um, she's like, I was, I must have been 22 by that time. She's a year older than me. She's 23. And she's, um, let's see, I'm 10, she's 14. She's like, so I was like a year sober. She's like, what, four years sober? And for some reason, she scared the heck out of me. I have no idea why. But she said things like, um, she said she was going to be my sponsor. I didn't get a say in it. I had to go to seven meetings a week. I tried to tell her that I had a two-year-old. I couldn't go to meetings every day. And she said, I didn't ask for your opinion. <laughs> um, she had me, she's the one that had me write out that inventory, and I kept telling her, you know, I'm not even, I don't even think I'm an alcoholic, and so she made me um, write that out, and it was in doing that fifth step inventory with her that I, you know, the truth is, is that um, I had this um, idea in my head that if, if I could be an addict, then the solution would be to quit using drugs, but then I could still drink. If I admitted I was an alcoholic, I knew that meant that one day at a time, <laughs> I could never drink again. And that was horrifying. When I was just a few weeks sober in that um, residential treatment facility, I ended up in the uh, mental institution for a couple weeks. And I, um, I got on my bed and pulled my knees up to my chest and started rocking and humming because I wanted them to tell me I was crazy. Crazy meant I could still drink. I mean, anything but alcoholic meant I could still drink. And so I would not, I could not say that I was alcoholic. And thankfully, I did this inventory with her, and I, in going to speaker meetings, I started to identify with the disease of alcoholism. The only thing is that I thought that, <laughs> I had this idea in my head that if somebody got to Alcoholics Anonymous by drinking wine coolers or something, <laughs> which was my image of what an alcoholic was, that I just thought, <laughs> you guys are kind of, I mean, I'm, I thought I was a little tougher than your average alcoholic. <laughs> what a joke. But, you know, what? Uh, with my, <laughs> I was all of 21 and <laughs> extremely conceited. Um, so 
I, I would go to meetings and I would say, my name is Yvonne and I'm an alcoholic and a junkie. <laughs> I had to say junkie because I wanted you, I wasn't just a garden variety addict. <laughs> I wanted you all to know that I was a little tougher than you. And um, I'm so grateful. I didn't have somebody, my sponsor didn't ask me to stop saying that. What she did was she sat me down in her living room one day and she played a tape of a man named Johnny Harris. And what I heard this man say was that as long as he was an alcoholic and a something else, then he was different than you or from you, and that the program that worked for you may not work for him. And I had been here just long enough in Alcoholics Anonymous to feel something attractive here. There was something. I, it was enough to get me to the meeting the next night and the next night and the next night and the next night and to keep calling that sponsor that scared me. And there was just something. You guys had something that, um, that I had never experienced in my life. And it was sitting there. I thought, I thought to myself, this man is right. I identify like that because I want you all to think I'm different than you. And if I'm different, maybe the program that does work for you won't work for me. And I'll tell you, I, that day I became a garden variety alcoholic. Um, and it's even bizarre for me now to even think of, I'm an alcoholic. I know I suffer from the disease of alcoholism. I'm grateful that, um, that I, that I lived the kind of life I did out there because, um, because it took everything I did to bring me to this great life that I have today. Now, this woman, um, she set me on a journey in Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, I was not a rocket to start him here. <laughs> I, um, <laughs> when I got out of that treatment facility, I was, um, I got a job, we had to get a job, and um, I, mine was at the Hex department store, and I was making six fifty an hour. <laughs> And I was living in the projects. I had this little girl, and I kept thinking, I'm never going to get ahead. I'm never going to get ahead. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because now I deserve something because <laughs> I got sober. Um, and it occurred to me one day that when that Madam Kaylee let me go from the escort service, I left the part out where Kaylee said, you know, I'm a sober member of the program Alcoholics Anonymous. If you would ever like to get sober, I'd be more than happy to help you, and you could come back to work for me. <laughs> and so there I am, a year sober, and I think, um, huh, now why is it I'm making six fifty an hour when I could be making 200 <laughs> Should you run that by your sponsor? No, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't know what my sponsor's going to say, but the fact is my sponsor doesn't have any experience, and if she has a limited view of morality... <laughs> In my own head, what it is, is I'm a consenting adult. He's a consenting adult. It's none of the government's business, and none of AA's either, for that matter. <laughs> so I went back to work for, um, actually, they were out of business, but once the idea was planted, <laughs> uh, I started working for another escort service, and, um, and I'd, go, uh, I'd go to my meetings. I went to seven meetings a week, and I did whatever commitments they had me do. You have to be elected into commitments there. It's a little, you don't just sign up for them and get them, but... Whatever commitments I got, I, I would do, and, and then at night I would go on call, and then what would happen is my behavior escalated. Um, now I'm shoplifting, even though I have plenty of money, because uh, once I start doing one thing, it just it all seems to escalate for me. And then I'm committing fraud over here, and um, and at the same time, I'm sitting in my means of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm seeing people come in new, watching them for a year, and seeing something happen to them. And I um, I was one of those people in my means of in my meetings, I cried every day. I would sit there in this little ball of self-pity crying all the time. And I felt so rotten. And I thought, what is wrong? I'm doing the same thing these people are. I'm going to the same number of meetings. I have commitments. I'm picking up newcomers. Why don't I feel any better? And um, I, um, one night when I was working, <laughs> I realized... Um, I realized that I couldn't stand the way I felt about myself. I felt extreme self-loathing. And I realized that no matter what I thought of it logically in my own head, I had to drink in order to numb the feelings that I had about myself when I was living that kind of life. And I ended up getting honest with my sponsor and telling my sponsor everything um, that I was doing and asking my sponsor to direct my life. And what I thought was if I could do everything my sponsor asked me, like every single thing, uh, like don't even complain, don't, I mean, just everything. If I can put my all into it, I can see whether this really works or not. Because I, I don't really know. I'm, I'm doing stuff that I haven't really given it everything. I'm not doing what our book asks us to do. And so I, I, I put myself, I'll tell you, my life immediately got better. Um, I started sponsoring the first person. I still sponsor her today. She's um, eight years sober, and she's saved my life, eight and a half years sober, and she saved my life um, 
<laughs> she saved my life many times, but um, I got I got immediately better in Alcoholics Anonymous. And the one thing that was missing in my life, though, was a relationship with God, which I decided wasn't necessary. Um, I missed the part in the book where it says that the main purpose is to develop a relationship with God. <laughs> <laughs> I had, um, <laughs> somewhere along the line, I became agnostic. I, I, when I was little, I had the feeling of God, but I lost it somewhere really young. And what I thought was, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not a God, but I won't ever feel there's God. I can't feel God, and nobody can ever make me feel God. And therefore, I refused to pray. I, would, I never once in my entire sobriety got down on my knees and prayed to God because it just seemed like a futile exercise. And what I realized today is that I, I wouldn't even take, you know, I would take any AA, AA action. What I, you know, non-religious is what I thought in my head, and it's not. But I would take any action, whether or not I believed it worked. But I had a rebelliousness, stu- a stubborn rebelliousness. It talks about in our 11th step in the 12 and 12, where I absolutely refused to get on my knees and pray. And what I know today is that I lacked humility to take an action, not knowing what the result was. Um, I um, God works for me in mysterious ways. I have to say, I um, when I was two and a half years sober, um, I got on a plane and I went to a conference in Anaheim from D.C. And it was while I was in Anaheim that I visited the Pacific Group, um, their Wednesday night meeting for the first time, and I fell in love with the Pacific Group. And I said, I'm I'm going to move here and be a member of this group. Um, but coming back from that uh, trip, I was on a layover in Houston, and when they called my airplane. I stood up really quickly, and I had this big, heavy book bag on one arm and my boarding pass in my hand. And when I stood up, my book bag slid down my arm, and my arm jerked up, and I clipped off some cornea with my boarding pass. <laughs> I mean, that could happen to anyone. <laughs> I, I, I got on the plane thinking, you know, you hit yourself in the eye, and it stings for a little bit, but it goes away. <laughs> well, no, it didn't go away. <laughs> By the time I got to D.C., I knew that there was nothing really wrong with me. And uh, my dad picked me up from the airport, and he took me to the emergency room. That's where I found out I clipped off some cornea. And it wasn't supposed to be a big deal, but... But um, I developed an infection in my cornea, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And um, I ended up getting referred from ophthalmologists. No, no, they're not ophthalmologists. Whatever, the eye doctors. Um, And I ended up at Johns Hopkins University, which was like an hour and 15-minute drive for me. And what happened over a couple of months is that I went blind in my eye. I I had necrotizing bacteria eating the cornea away, and I developed an ulcer in my eye that felt like somebody was sticking a hot poker in my eye. It was like the most extreme amount of pain I've ever experienced in my life. It was nonstop. Um, I had to see the doctors at Johns Hopkins seven days a week. I had to drive there. Well, my mom would drive me, actually. I couldn't drive very easily. But um, on Sundays, even, I had to see the on-call surgeon making the rounds. And at one point for over a month, um, I had to put eye drops in my eye every half an hour 24 hours a day for over a month. And I didn't have to set an alarm clock to wake up in half an hour because I could not get 30 minutes of sleep at a clip. And um, one night I went to my eye doctor. It was a Saturday night. It was one, you know, I'd go there all day and I have to sit and wait till they had time. It was evening by the time I left. And this doctor said, uh, you know, Yvonne, 50 50, you're going to lose your eye altogether in the next week. There's nothing more we can do for you. And um, I am. Um, I left that night. My mom drove me and dropped me off at my meeting. And on the way there, I made a critical decision. Um, I decided that what I was going to do was the next day I was going to go shoot a bag of heroin. I wasn't going to drink. I wanted to shoot a bag of heroin because I wanted something to instantly take the pain away. I thought, I can't bear this for another day. No one should ever have to experience any kind of pain like this. Um, And I went to my meeting that night. And this is why I have a home group. Um, I was literally crazy. I was now sponsoring this girl who I still sponsor today. (laughs) And... um, I, she loves to talk about, um, people were telling her, your sponsor is out of her mind. You need to get yourself another sponsor. <laughs> and she said she would have if they hadn't have said that. <laughs> and I am so grateful because there were some days I didn't drink because I tried to picture picking up a chip in front of my baby. Um, and, uh... <laughs> But this is why I have a home group. This woman, I, okay, yeah, I lost my train of thought there for a moment. <laughs> I was crazy. I was literally out of mind crazy, out of my mind crazy. But on this particular night, somebody noticed, people noticed that I was, I guess, crazier than usual. And um, 
A bunch of people said a lot of different things to me, unsolicited, I might add, that night. <laughs> but this girl who had actually been my first sponsor sat me down, and um, she told me that I needed to go home and pray for the removal of the obsession I had with my eye. <laughs> Nothing ever made me matter in Alcoholics Anonymous than her saying that to me. I hated her. <laughs> I thought to myself, um, there are PhDs at Johns Hopkins that don't have a solution for me. You can't seem to make it out of community college, but you think you do. <laughs> That's what I thought. I didn't say it because I was still scared of her. <laughs> I thought, it, what I heard was I was faking it. And I thought, are you out of your mind? I had this if you want to see a picture of it, I have a picture. It's my passport photo. Anyway, I had this eye, this eye. I mean, I would sit on the subway and people would move. <laughs> it was hideous. Um, <laughs> and I thought she said I was faking it. I thought you're out of your mind. I, this isn't an obsession. It's I have a medical problem. <laughs> and I went home and I lay in bed that night. Um, I lay in bed trying to plot how I could kill her and get away with it. <laughs> and I was seething. It's one of the few times in my sobriety where I was so angry I could have, like, killed anything that was right there in front of me. I just, oh, hated it. And for a couple of hours, that I just lay there, and um, that voice started, you know, why don't you just get on your knees and pray? Oh, that's ridiculous. You don't pray for removal. What? Ah. It, this went on for a couple hours, and I finally got down on my knees. And I have no idea what I said, but the feeling was something like, Please remove the obsession I have with my eye, whatever. <laughs> it was the first time I had been on my knees in my sobriety, and I climbed back into bed, and I fell asleep, and I didn't wake up for six hours. And when I woke up six hours later, I had very little pain left. It was tolerable, and... Um, my mom came and picked me up and took me to Johns Hopkins that day, and the doctor, the on-call surgeon that day, was the same doctor that had seen me the night before, and he said there was no medical explanation for the healing that had occurred in my eye overnight. And um, it was that day I got my greatest gift in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that's a relationship with God. But I also learned my greatest lesson in AA that day, too, because what I judged to be the worst thing that could ever happen to me, nobody should ever have to experience this once they're sober. I... I couldn't imagine anything worse happening to me. And what I judged to be the worst thing that could happen to me, I got my greatest gift, a relationship with God, the feeling of God again. So who am I to judge what's good or bad in my life, really? Um, that lesson has carried forward to today, and that doesn't mean that I don't feel pain anymore. I feel just as much pain as I did before. But what happens for me today when I experience pain is I think, oh, remember, Yvonne, <laughs> the last time you thought it was the worst thing that happened to you, you got your greatest gift. You have to sit through this, and then one day you'll understand. And that has happened to me time and time again. I, um, I've, I've had some, who was it asked me if uh, my sobriety has been a bed of roses or something like you know, I've had um, some extremely painful experiences. When I was five years sober, I was engaged to be married, and then I found out he had another fiancé in another state. <laughs> yeah, he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, too. <laughs> and when I lay in bed <laughs> for four days, <laughs> sick to my stomach and not even able to get myself out, I thought, you know, Yvonne, this... <laughs> I said it to myself again, and I remembered, you know, you're going to get through this pain, and you're going to realize that this is this is the way your life should have been. And, you know, this last year, um, I, um, I've i had a couple of corneal transplants in sobriety um, to try to uh, bring the sight back to my eye because it's completely scarred, so I can't see through it anymore. And um, I had my second one last October, and the first one rejected. So last time, um, now I'm seeing a doctor at Jules Stein um, in L.A., and this doctor said I had to go on a course of immunosuppressant medication in order to, so my body wouldn't fight this cornea. And um, I was supposed to be on steroids for two months, and uh, unfortunately it dragged on for like 15. I'm, <laughs> I'm almost off. But in that period of time, like when I got the corneal transplant right before, I was like in the, oh, I can't say the best shape of my life because it wasn't score shape, but. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> But I was, I was actually, I was training for a marathon, and my longest run was 23 miles, and I was running um, at least three days a week, um, and I went on these steroids and, like, instantly gained 80 pounds. <laughs> it was like, 
it was horrible. I, um, I, in fact, I, um, they finally let me off a few months ago, but I've had to do a really slow detox and I'm not entirely off. I'm actually on five milligrams. I have two weeks to go, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, like that, um, it's one of the most, I, I have to say it's not the most painful thing that I think was, but it's certainly one of the most hideous things I've ever been through is gaining two of me. <laughs> There's a lesson in humility. <laughs> um, you know, but at the same time, I, I know that everything, I've been around Alcoholics Anonymous just long enough to know that everything is going to be okay if I just sit through it. This is not going to be the end of the world. And, you know, just last week I had this girl call me up who, um, now, I'll tell you, I didn't handle this quite that gracefully, though. When, it, when I first started putting on the weight, I made the decision that I was never going to, I was not going to meetings again until I lost the weight. Um, and <laughs> I thought it was going to be really brief at that time, so it's a good thing I didn't follow through with that, because it's, it's been like a year now. But um, um, I, uh, of course, I, what I pictured was, why don't you run that one by your sponsor? And then I thought, I'm not even going to say it to her. <laughs> and I thought, okay, you just have to go to meetings. And just last week, this uh, girl with a couple of years called me, and she's on medication. She's putting on weight, and she hasn't been to a meeting in three months, and she wants to know how it is I had the courage to get up and keep going. And I had to explain my experience with her. And the truth is, my life is never all bad anymore. Um, I've had an amazing adventure in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, obviously, the escort service thing didn't work out for me when I was new. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, I didn't want to go back to Hex making six fifty an hour. And at the time, I was, you know, my the treatment facility I went into was... You know, they had a wonderful plan for me. I went into the projects with my daughter, and um, it was, you know, a great deal. Um, and so what I did was I ended up going back to community college. And now I was a horrible high school student and junior high, actually, <laughs> uh, in college. But, um, <laughs> I, um, but I thought if I could just get a two-year degree, maybe I could get some kind of job where I could support my daughter and move out of the projects. And um, I, what I learned was to apply what I learned in AA to school. And what that meant for me was that I would get to class early. I would stay late. I would ask the teacher questions. I would do my homework. I would read what I'm supposed to do. I would show up for my study appointments like I was supposed to. And when I did that, I found out I got straight A's. And it was, I, mean, I was shocked. Every report card I would get, it'd be straight A's again. And Towards the end of that two-year college, uh, my school counselor said, you know, you could go to a four-year university. And I thought, oh, that's right. You know, our state school, if you can get through two years, you're guaranteed admission. And I said, oh, yeah, I can go to the state school, right? And he's like, no, I think you could go just about anywhere you'd like. And uh, he helped me apply, and I got into George Washington University on an academic scholarship. And two years later, I graduated first in my field. And um, we graduate on outside the White House on the ellipsis out there. And I'll tell you, um, my mother sat out there in front of the White House with my daughter on her lap and watched me graduate first in my field from George Washington. Sorry. Woo, sometimes it gets me and sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> The reason that really gets me, though, is because a couple months after that, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. And, um, and uh, my, mother, um, my mother knew. Oh, that's so funny. Just sometimes it just comes up out of the blue. My mother knew um, when she was dying that her granddaughter was safe now. Because of Alcoholics Anonymous, my mother didn't worry about her granddaughter anymore. And my mother lived long enough to see me get admitted and start law school. <laughs> Uh, I went to a very conservative law school in Virginia, and um, <laughs> I sat there the first day I was looking at all my conservative classmates, and I thought to myself, you know, I bet I'm the only junkie hooker in here. <laughs> Just a guess, but um, <laughs> um, I was going to go to law school in California, but my mother had been diagnosed with cancer, and she asked me if I would please stay in the state with her. Um, not because she wanted me around her, because she said she didn't want her granddaughter being taken away from her, and um, and I owed that to my mother, so I stayed. And I'm so grateful I did because she died during my first year of law school, and I was straight and clear with her. You know, um, thank God for a sponsor too, because. Um, I had made amends to my mother. My mother didn't even want to hear it. She forgave me instantly. The, the amends were for me, really, is what they were for. The only thing that I didn't have the opportunity to do was to pay my mother back. 
And I'm so grateful I had a sponsor working in my life because my sponsor reminded me, Yvonne, you're not going to have the opportunity to pay her back. You need to ask her what she wants you to do with the money you owe her. I'm so grateful for that because that loose end got tied up and my mother told me what to do with the money. And of course it has to do with her granddaughter. <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, and I'm more than happy to do it. Um, when I graduated from law school, I finally had the opportunity to move out to LA to, you know, I had long since gotten a sponsor in the Pacific group because like I said, I fell in love with that group and I would take every vacation I could and save up money and go out and visit. Um, and I just loved it. I loved, a pr I loved meetings where people would talk about solution from the disease of alcoholism. And it was the first time I felt like, you know, when I was new, I didn't walk into AA and think I'm home. I never thought that. I thought this is horrible. This is boring. This is, this is any, ugh, this is horrible. But when I started, um, when I got busy in Alcoholics Anonymous and I started taking the actions that are outlined in our book and I started following the uh, recommendations <laughs> of my sponsor, um, the direction, when I started to do what my sponsor asked me to do, um, Alcoholics Anonymous became anything but boring for me. I, I love Alcoholics Anonymous. Anyways, I graduated from law school and I got the opportunity to move out to Los Angeles. And, um, you know, I, I passed the bar out there in California. And um, <laughs> my daughter and I, we just bought a house out there. And I'll tell you, people like me don't live in houses. Last night, um, I was a little sleepy when I woke up this morning because last night my daughter wanted to go out and buy the Christmas tree and get it all done. And um, we, <laughs> we went to Home Depot and got a Christmas tree and brought it home and we decorated it together. And I was just sitting there like, what, what an amazing life I have today. Um, I don't deserve any of the life that I have. Uh, but I, I'll certainly live it. <laughs> um, what I do today, um, I... Um, I raised this little girl. By the way, she's 11 years old. She's perfectly fine. Um, well, I'm, I'm saving a seat for her. <laughs> but, I mean, she, has its, she doesn't have any obvious ill effects from what I did to her. But um, she's actually quite beautiful. My, she's 11. She's 5 foot 4. I always have to talk glowingly of her. But she's 5 foot 4. She has this, like, really bright red hair. She's dynamite. She's beautiful, but she's also a little punk rocker <laughs> and personally dyed black hair and she's into the sex pistols now, but, um, <laughs> what do you do? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I mentioned she hangs out on the, at the skate park on Venice beach. Uh, <laughs> but do you know what? She's actually doing a lot better than I was at that age. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I raised this little girl. My sponsor helps me to do that because I have a hard time in my in my mind trying to decide what I should do as far as my family is concerned and what I should do as far as AA, like my meetings and commitments are. So I let my sponsor figure that out for me because I always go one way or the other too much, you know, too much into my family or too much into AA. My sponsor helps me keep a balance. I go to right now I go to four meetings a week. That's the least amount I've gone to. As my daughter started to get older, my sponsor said I needed to be there a little bit more for her. Um, so I go to four meetings a week. I sponsor people. We go through the book. Um, I have commitments at my meetings, and I'm an active member of my group. And I'll tell you, obviously, uh, my life today is nothing like it was. I work in a great law firm in um, L.A., and they have no – they think I'm a stellar employee. They, <laughs> they have no idea anything about me, <laughs> and I've been there two and a half years. But, um, you know, everything <laughs> – I always say I always hear um, – God, I so relate to this. When I heard Johnny Harris speak, he said um, that if everything he has today is everything he ever has, and he's already overpaid. You know, that's how my life is today. I don't deserve anything that I have, but I love my life, and I have you to thank. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.